What does it mean to lay it all down for the joy of the Lord? To give up our lives for the joy that we gain through that. And before I get into this this morning, I just want to say, it was just an amazing moment for me. I walked in that back door after everyone was standing, and I see all these little people standing on the back of the pews so that they could see. It's just amazing. I appreciate that section over there so much. Glad you're here. The text this morning is from Galatians 5, verses 16 through 26. If you want to, you can open your Bibles to Galatians 5. But I'm going to begin with verse 24 and 25. Galatians 5, 24 through 25. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed their passions and the desires of their sinful nature to the cross and they have crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us follow the Spirit in every part of our lives. You know, those are just amazing words. To nail the passions and desires of the sinful nature to the cross and to just leave them there. What does that mean? What does that look like? What does it mean to die to self? to nail the passions that we have to the cross. And what did Jesus mean in Matthew 16, 24 through 25 when he told his disciples, if any one of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, you must deny yourself, and you must take up your cross and follow me. If you hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will find it. And what would it benefit you if you gained the whole world but lost your soul? What is worth more than your soul? What does it mean to take up our cross and follow Jesus? His disciples would have known exactly what a cross was all about. Because in the time of Jesus, the cross was a very familiar thing. It was the most cruel form of execution that the Romans could think of. And they would crucify people in the public so that everyone could look and they could see. This is what happens to you if you don't do what we tell you to do. Four years before Jesus was born, 4 BC, there was a Jewish revolt against Rome. And in one day, they crucified 2,000 men. And they had that long line of crosses right by the road so everyone could look by and they could see. That's what happens. That's what the cross is all about. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, and he didn't say take up someone else's cross. He said, you got to take up your own cross. You have to be willing to die to self. But the irony is that when we die to self, we begin new life. In order to have a resurrection, there must be a death. In order to find this new life in Jesus, we have to be willing to die to ourselves. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German pastor, professor, theologian, he died in a Nazi concentration camp. They hanged him about two weeks before that camp was liberated. He was a pastor, and there, and there are stories of, of Bonhoeffer and how in the midst of the horrible, the horrible circumstances of that concentration camp, he lived as a pastor, ministering to people. He would give the people who were starving a part of his food. He would pray with them. He would minister to them. He would give them hope and encouragement right there in the most horrible circumstances that we can imagine. The spirit of God, the new life that was within him, the light of Jesus that was in his life could not be quenched by a concentration camp. He said these words that there is no easy way to God because God resides behind the cross. And he was saying, if you want to get to God, 
you have to go through the cross. These are words that he wrote. The earthly form of Christ is the form that died on the cross. The image of God is the image of Christ crucified. It is this image that the life of the disciples must be conformed to. In other words, they must be conformed to his death. The Christian life is a life of crucifixion. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, he coined the phrase costly discipleship. Costly discipleship. We look at that and we say, now what does that mean? Because aren't we saved by grace? Isn't How is that costly? And it's true, we're saved by grace. Ephesians chapter 2 says, by grace you're saved through faith. It is not of yourselves, it is a free gift of God, so that no one can boast. It is a free gift. We don't deserve it. There's no way that we can earn it. It is a free gift given it to us. But if we accept that gift, if we bring into ourselves the life-giving power of God, the Spirit of God comes within us, it is costly because it costs us our lives. It changes the way that we live and the things that we do. And we give that up out of gratitude for what Jesus Christ has done for us through his death and resurrection. And we experience this new life. Going back to Galatians 5, verses 16 through 26. And here it talks about this life of the spirit and the life of our sinful nature. It speaks of dying to self. Galatians 5, 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what our sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your own good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, when the Spirit is directing your life, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. We can see it. When you follow your sinful nature, this is your life. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. And let me tell you again, as I have said before, that anyone living that kind of life will not will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then he says, there is no law about those things. If you are living the life of the Spirit, if those things are being produced in your life, brothers and sisters, there is no law against any of that. And then he goes on to say, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed their passions and their desires to the cross. They've crucified them there. And since we are living by the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not be conceited. Let us not provoke one another. Let us not be jealous of one another. In that passage, Paul is writing about this conflict between flesh versus spirit. This battle going on between our sinful nature and the life of the spirit. He says these two opposing forces are at battle within us. James, James says the same thing. James says, where do all these conflicts and disputes arise among you? Why are all these things happening? He says, it's because of the battle that is raging inside of you. It's those carnal cravings inside of you. That's why you do those things. A battle between the spirit and our sinful nature. And I just want to put up on the screen the stark difference in those lists. Look at those lists. The life of the flesh. Immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins. And it's like, you know, Paul has gotten tired of writing sins down. And he, just, so he just says, well, all the other sins are there too. 
they're all there. The life of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How many want to live the life of the Spirit? If you want to live the life of the Spirit, raise your hand. You know, we look at that list, and it's like, why would I ever want to live on the left side? What is, what is dry? Do I want to be angry? Do I want to be filled with envy and drunkenness and immorality? Is that the kind of life I want to live? Or would I prefer to live a life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? And the question becomes, why does that left side pull so hard? We don't want to live that way, so why is it that that becomes such a strong pull? Why is there this battle when we can all see how we'd want to live? The sinful nature is so powerful within us. It is such a strong pull because Satan is always wanting to get us. And he knows our temptations. He knows our weaknesses. He knows the parts of the flesh that we are especially vulnerable to. And he's just waiting. 1 Peter 5, 8 Peter writes it this way, stay alert, pay attention, don't go to sleep, you better be alert, you better watch out for your great enemy the devil. He is prowling around like a lion looking for someone to devour. It's an amazing, it's an amazing passage. The devil is constantly waiting and watching and hoping that he can trip us up because he does not want us to live the life of the fruit of the Spirit. More than anything else, he wants us to fall into our sinful natures. And he's always there. Now I'm going to tell a story this morning that I told many years ago because since I'm at the end of my ministry, I can tell any story I want. <laughs> our middle son, Eric, was such a kind, gentle soul. He really was just so easy. He was the kind of kid where one day when I walked into the house, he was sitting on the designated timeout chair. And I was like, Eric, what did you do that mom set you in that chair? And he said, oh, mom didn't tell me to sit here. But he had done something that he thought was wrong, and so he decided maybe he needed a timeout. <laughs> I was like, well, sit there as long as you want. That's fine. So one day, I was out in the front yard with Lindsay. And we heard this shrill yelp from the backyard. And it was her little dog, Muffy. Muffy was precious to Lindsay. They were tight. He was their most faithful companion. So Lindsay takes off running, and I run with her. And we go around the side of the house, and there stands Eric with a BB gun. Now, this is two weeks in a row with gun stories. But that's, you know. <laughs> He's standing there with a BB gun, and I say, Eric, why did you shoot Muffy? And he looked at me and he said, and he was only six years old, probably, the devil made me do it. <laughs> and I kind of laughed. It was like, well, yeah. But we take responsibility for what we do. Yeah. The devil is always present. The devil is always after us. But we have responsibility for our own lives. We have responsibility as to where we're going to live, on which side of that we're going to live on. And yes, there are times when we fail. We all fail. Not anyone here this morning is perfect. We know that. We all fail. And then it is the amazing grace of Jesus that gives us forgiveness of our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will forgive us. And then we must commit ourselves and dedicate ourselves once again to living the life of the Spirit. To die to self. To be willing to commit our lives completely and totally to living with the Spirit. And the one translation says to walk by the Spirit. And I love that image, actually, the Spirit walking with us. Yeah, Satan is out there, but so is the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is walking with us. 
And if we will just open ourselves up to his spirit, if we will just die to ourselves, his spirit will produce that fruit in our lives. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and the desires of their sinful nature to the cross, and they have crucified them there. And since we are living by the Spirit, let's also follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you this morning. I thank you that we can lay down our lives and we can trust you. We thank you that you have sent your Holy Spirit to empower us, to be able to live the life of love, joy, peace, and patience, kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. God, we all want to live that way. And we recognize that it is only by the power of the Spirit, it is only when we give ourselves completely to you that our lives will produce that fruit. And so I pray this morning for an anointing of your Spirit, for an invasion of your Spirit into each one of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I invite the prayer team to come forward at this time as well. This morning, this prayer area is open again. The last two weeks, people have come forward and you've, you've written notes and you've put them in the prayer wall. And we're doing this through the Lenten season. This morning, there will be ushers bringing them to the people who can't come forward. So if you want to have one, but you can't come forward, just raise your hand and the ushers will give you a piece of paper and bring it up for you. You may be struggling this morning with a temptation. There may be something in your life that the devil seems to be working overtime on right now, and you just want to be able to give that to God in a prayer and say, give me victory over this, because in my heart I want to follow you. There may be others of us who who want to say, God, I just want to more fully experience that fruit in my life that you've promised through your spirit. I want to experience that more fully. And I just pray a, a greater connection with the spirit. That's what I long for. There may be someone here this morning who wants to put a prayer in there that has nothing to do with the message, but you're just carrying a burden and you want to just put it in the wall and say, God, I'm giving this to you. I trust in you. And this morning, I would also encourage us to put our praises and thanksgivings. You know, when we pray to God, it isn't just our burdens. But we also bring to him our praise and our thanksgiving. And you may want to just write a thanksgiving or praise on a piece of paper and put it in the wall. It's an amazing prayer wall. And I would just challenge us, you know, over the next weeks, especially as we move towards Holy Week, this is always open. To come in during the day, you can just sit here and pray. Pray for all of those papers in that wall. Let's just make this time a very special time of praying as a community. So I invite you this morning, if you have something that you would like to write on a piece of paper, to just come forward and put it in the wall. If you want prayer, our prayer team is here. Let's just have a time of worship and prayer together.